We will begin our 1 Corinthians study for tonight. We'll pick up where we left off last week. 1 Corinthians 9. And chapter 7, 8, and 9 really all flow into one another. So the past couple weeks, we two weeks ago we studied chapter 7. Last week was chapter 8. And so we want to keep in mind the things that we had read and talked about in the previous weeks. Because uh, they really, in order to grasp the fullness of what Paul is going to be talking about in chapter 9, we need to recall what was being said uh, in 7 and 8. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 1. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless this Bible study tonight, Father. We are in need of your help as always. We pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint every word, that it would be all of you and none of me, and that the discussions that we would have and the sharing and, Lord, the, the, the time that we have here tonight, that, Lord, it would be blessed by you and that the enemy would be cast off. No deception, the deceiver, the lying spirits of Satan will be cast off and that only the Holy Spirit and that which pertains to the word of Almighty God that flows from your throne will be permitted in this Bible study tonight. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not you my work in the Lord? And so that's the opening verse of chapter 9. But I want us to just drop back one more verse and read the last verse that we read last week. And Paul says in verse 13 of chapter 8, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world stands, lest I make my brother to offend. So the very next sentence that Paul begins in this letter, and we got to remember that the letter that Paul wrote was not divided up by chapters and verses. It was a flowing letter. So he says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not you my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are you in the Lord. So clearly throughout the time that Paul wrote letters, there was many different times he was having to defend his apostleship. There were ungodly people. There was uh, people who had crept into the church and they were attempting to challenge Paul's apostleship and his authority in the Lord Jesus. So Paul would have to write some letters to defend his authority in Jesus Christ. And he tells them basically in verse 2, if other people don't say that I'm an apostle, fine. But you know that I am because you are the very fruit of my ministry. You are the very fact that I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ because of the things that I have shared with you and has produced in your life. Verse 3, my answer to them that do examine me, that are, that are challenging my authority, is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Peter? So these two verses, 4 and 5, are reflecting back to chapter 7 and chapter 8. Chapter 7 is talking about our singleness talking about marriage, talking about separation, talking about a father's role with his daughter that doesn't marry. Paul gave all of that laid out in chapter 7. So he is referring back to what he has just written. And he says, don't we have the freedom to eat what we want? That's what we talked about last week. We're not restricted in our diet. What we eat or drink is not going to make us holy or, or unholy as the law would portray that it, that it would. We are free from that in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that we're free to marry. If God would bring us a spouse, we're free to marry. As Peter is also an example and many other, other of the brethren. He says those that are attempting to uh, examine my authority in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Don't we understand that all of these things have, we are free to do? Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who plants a vineyard and eats not of the fruit thereof? Or who feeds a flock and eats not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things to a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, that you shall not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be a partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Before we keep moving on, I want to pause, because Paul has laid down several different things here that they were attempting to challenge. Many of the people in the scriptures that were coming against Paul attempted to try to use the grace that Paul preached against him, okay? In fact, we can read in the book of Acts when they brought these accusations against Paul, they brought accusations against him that he was even talking and teaching against the law of Moses. Well, we know that what Paul preached was the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and that the law of Moses has been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. Not that you just don't have to obey the law of Moses. That wasn't it. It was you obey the Lord Jesus Christ and it's in him the law of Moses is automatically fulfilled. You see, when I'm standing before God, God sees me as a law keeper, not as a lawbreaker. It's not because I've never broken the Ten Commandments or because I follow the law of Moses perfectly. By no means. It's because the Lord Jesus did all of those things. So I am abiding in the vine, and when the God sees me, he sees the blood. And so I look in the eyes of God as a law keeper, not as a lawbreaker. The law and the purpose of the law was to condemn, to make me realize that I am a sinner and I need help. But yet there's no victory in the law. So the victory is found only in Jesus, and that is why the Lord Jesus came. He came to set us free. But the problem that they did back then and that people even do today is they attempt to use that freedom as an excuse to continue to live like the world. We see it all the time in our society now. How many people talk about being free to do whatever they want and they're actually just living in sin. There's not even a glimpse of holiness in their life. There's not even a glimpse of the Holy Spirit's working within them. Because they're just continuing to live the way they want to live. They're not living a crucified life. They're not living by taking up the cross of Christ and following after Jesus, following his word. There's not the desire in their heart to say, God, I thank you for setting me free from the law. I thank you for setting me free from my sin. And now, Lord, I have a hunger to want to just follow after Jesus. Amen? That is what the Holy Spirit will do in your life. If somebody is not being led to holiness, the Holy Spirit is not at work. Amen? Because let me, let's understand this. The Holy Spirit will work in holiness. And the Holy Spirit always works within the confines of the cross of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us and he is constantly pointing us to Jesus Christ. When people say that they have met Jesus and that they know Jesus, but yet they are continuing to live as if they had never encountered God, never encountered the Lord Jesus Christ, I arguably will challenge whether or not they're actually really born again. And I know that there would be some people say, well, who do you think you are to judge someone whether or not they're saved or not? The word tells me to. Amen? Amen. The Bible tells me to know those who labor among us. Right. The Bible tells me to judge them by their fruits. And the people who say that are usually the people who are continuing to live in sin and they're just hoping to get to heaven. But who are they deceiving? Themselves. They're deceiving themselves, 100%. They are trying to convince themselves that they're going to make it one day through that glorious gate. 
But yet, they're not doing it within the confines of what the Word of God has ordered that narrow road to be. Amen? So that's the same thing that they were doing even back then. They were attempting to challenge Paul's authority, and they were saying that he was, because he was eating meat sacrificed to idols, or because he was eating meat that was not considered clean, that he was unholy, he was unprofitable uh, as an apostle. And he was challenging them that G Jesus Christ is what has made me holy. Not the fact that I have kept the law or broken the law, but it's that Jesus Christ has fulfilled it in me. That was the message that Paul was preaching. And that is grace. Grace comes into our life because we don't deserve it. But he has given it to us freely by faith. So he says, uh, and he, he's talking about even laboring in the kingdom of God. Paul's using this as an example. He's saying, doesn't Paul and Barnabas, don't they have a right to be able to stop the workforce and to be able to be su successfully supported by the church? Paul's saying, if we're ministers of the gospel, shouldn't we receive payment for the message that we're preaching? That's what he says in verse 7. He says, who goes to warfare anytime at his own charges? If you were in the army and you were sent to warfare, those soldiers do not have to pay for the battle. They don't even have to pay for their own food. All of that is given to them because they are soldiers. And he says even a farmer, if he's going to plant and go to the proper use of planting and, and harvesting, doesn't he get benefited from all of that? A sheep farmer, cow, dairy farmer, don't they reap the benefits of their labor? Paul's saying it's the same way with the kingdom of God. That Paul and Barnabas should be able to reap the, the benefits of, of their labor. But he says in verse 11, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap carnal things? So if Paul and Barnabas has preached spiritual things and they have been benefited spiritually by the ministry of Paul and Barnabas, he's saying, is it a big deal that we would then be able to be supported carnally in this life? But he says, if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we? Rather, nevertheless, we've not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. This is important to grab a hold of because Jesus Christ has made me free from legalism. Amen. I am free from the legal letter of the law. I can have freedom in Christ Jesus. But Paul is saying that does not mean that we use that freedom excessively just for our own benefit. Which goes back to what we were talking about last week, what Paul was using as an example about meat. We got into that talking about uh, even restaurants and we were talking about uh, Texas Roadhouse. How there is a bar right there in Texas Roadhouse and uh, would you sit at the bar and eat a steak dinner right there in the bar? Um, we were having a discussion pertaining to what if somebody would see us sitting at the bar eating our steak, what would they think? Even though I think I could sit at that bar and not drink, I'm talking about eating my steak, and I would not be sinning. I have freedom in Christ Jesus. Yet, if someone comes in and sees me sitting at a bar eating a steak, what are they going to be thinking? I'm not going to use my freedom in Christ because it could hinder someone else. Because as Christians, my goal better be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because let me, let me share this. If you care so little about the gospel of Jesus and the kingdom of God, that you would be willing to risk that for your pleasure, there's a problem. There is a serious spiritual problem right there. A lot of people think that they are spiritually mature. And when they do that type of thing, they're actually showing their immaturity in Jesus Christ. I shared this Sunday that alcohol in the church has become so, so great. It's not new. It's been there all along. And you see people, and I've heard the the, the 
debates that they have. You know, Jesus turned water into wine. Uh, they look for different scriptures about you know the 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 the, the Holy Spirit being a the wine being a type of the Holy Spirit and all of these things. And when I hear people talk like that, I immediately think about their immaturity of the scriptures. Because the scripture from beginning to the end puts, when it talks about alcohol, intoxicating drink, it puts it always in a bad light. When Noah drank, he made himself naked and it brought shame. Lot got drunk, intoxicated, committed incest with his daughters. It goes on and on and on. Proverbs tell us whoever is deceived by alcohol is not wise. The scriptures go on and on to confirm that when people are given over to intoxicating drink, there is foolishness and a lack of wisdom right there. And it's ironic that so much today, Christians will try to use their freedom in the gospel to be able to drink, to be able to do things that they did before they knew Jesus. And I got to say, where is the spiritual maturity in our life if we have been come from darkness to light, but we are continuing to try to use the scriptures to bend it and twist it to keep doing the very thing that we know God set us free from? Amen? Amen. That's what Paul is talking about here. Is that as believers, we better not be using our Christian liberty, our Christian freedom for our own gain. Because Paul is saying, even we had every right to bill you for the, the hours that we spent preaching the gospel to you, ministering spiritually unto you. But he says we didn't do it. I think that is an, an incredible uh, tool. In fact, we use the same tool at the youth center. Uh, because at the youth center, we have done it for almost 30 years. Through all of those years, we have never had a single volunteer, obviously, get paid. We've never had paid staff for 30 years. Every work. I think there's a spider. Ooh, there's a fly. A fly? I'm <laughs> <laughs> like getting all buggy. Uh, for 30 years, we've had no paid staff. Every volunteer has done all of the labor, whether it's in the office, whether it's maintenance, or whether it was actual hours with kids with zero pay. And we're kind of proud of that. We're kind of uh, uh, pleased with that idea because we use that then for the kids. Because, well, who in their right mind would for 30 years give up every Friday of their life? I mean, I've not had a Friday, we have not had a Friday off for 30 years, except for, you know, Christmas vacation and such. For 30 years, every Friday night, volunteering at the youth center. Every Monday, every Tuesday, every Thursday, two Saturdays a month. The same people. And we use that as leverage, just as Paul is saying. He said, I, I, I labored my own self. I was a tent maker. I did all of this labor so that you did not have to pay me. I am still being attacked by a fly. <laughs> Curse you in Jesus' name. Uh, he's saying that we did all of this, and yet we never billed you. We never charged you. Yet we had the ability to do that. And he's saying, yet we did not use that freedom that we had in order to use it excessively against you. And in that same way... We ought not to do that in our own life with the Lord Jesus Christ. I am free from the, the legalism of the law. Praise the Lord. I don't have to every day go through the whole do's and don'ts. The Catholic Church, I mean, I pick on them a lot because there's so much material there to pick <laughs> on. But when, when I see, you know, and read about how I've never been a Catholic in my life, and I've only been to one Catholic service and it was a funeral in a Catholic church. But, you know, when they come in, they sit in that little booth and, you know, they say, bless me, Father, I have sinned. And they're going through, you know, it's been so many days since my last confession. And the whole process, I just, I get heavy hearted. I mean, that's such a burden. And then you have to tell them and then that guy tells you what to do. And 
what you need to do to find the forgiveness for that situation. I'm free from all of that stuff. Jesus has made me free. But that does not mean that I now say I am free from all of the legalism of the law because Jesus completed it for me. So now I'm just going to do whatever I want because I'm free. He's saying, no, think about the gospel. How will what you do hinder it for someone else? What if they see you doing that and you're just walking in the freedom that you have using it and yet it's a hindrance and a stumbling block to someone else? He says in verse 12, if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. That's in verse 12. We have, and rather we have suffered. We have allowed ourselves to be in a worse place so that you could prosper in the gospel of Jesus. There are things that I know as a believer I could argue and say that I have the freedom to do. Back with the meat that we talked about last week, you know, we were talking about bacon. You know, I know I'm free to eat bacon. And I like bacon. I like eating, you know, ham and lots, lots of bacon. <laughs> I even take the bacon grease and I keep it and fry my eggs in it. Oh, yeah. That's right. Bacon grease is like gold. Sure. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I know there is no sin in me eating bacon. Because I know Jesus has fulfilled the law, and I am in Christ Jesus, and I am free from the law. Plus, I'm a Gentile. The law was never intended for me anyway. It was for the Jews. That's right. But I know that I am free in Jesus to do that. But when Paul says in, in verse 13, the, the last verse of chapter 8, that if it would offend somebody, he would never eat flesh, never eat meat again, he is stating the seriousness of, of not abusing the power and the freedom that he has because he loves souls so much. Right. And what we talked about Sunday about our soul, that better be the heart of a, of a true Christian because if we give very little thought to the eternal soul, then I'm afraid we're living our life so materialistic, so, so in this temporal reality that we are clueless to the effects that take place in the spirit realm and that which is eternal. So that means whatever I do, that's what the word says, to bring glory to God, whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you drink, you'll do all to the glory of God. But that means that if I sat down and ate bacon in front of somebody who would be offended, it would be better for me not to eat the bacon, even though I have all assurance that I could do so and not sin and it would be fine. In fact, I could even argue that they got the problem because they don't understand what I got. You know? That's, that's not the heart of Paul. He's saying, care about their eternal soul to reach it. I will deny, I will suffer my own loss in order not to abuse the authority and the power that I have. They even did it with their laboring. They had every right to send a, a bill to this Corinthian church for the labor that they did in the gospel. But he says, we didn't even do that. We suffered it ourselves. We supported ourselves because we weren't going to allow the, the work of God, the gospel of Jesus to suffer not one bit. Amen. Even today, if you would go as a missionary to another foreign country, I kind of find it difficult to, I, my mind works good with scenarios. I don't know if yours does Mine, mine does. When, when I talked like last week about the scenario about Texas Roadhouse, there might be some people that say, why in the world would he be using a scenario like that in a, in a Bible study? It works in my mind. It helps me kind of put myself in a, something daily or something in, in our society where I can correlate and relate to it. And the meat deal, I mean, it's kind of difficult. You guys know what I'm talking about with the bacon, but when's the last time you met somebody that didn't want bacon? Or oh, that was offended that you ate bacon. I don't think, you know, it's not very often that in our society. But if you go as a missionary to someplace else, you betcha there's going to be issue. Even if you were a missionary and you went to another foreign country 
and the women and the men all wore turbans, you know. Missionaries, even though they know that they are free and that they don't have to wear a turban, what do they do when they go to a foreign country? They're wearing the turban because they're seeking to win these people for Jesus. They know that that turban doesn't add holiness to them. They know that it doesn't take away holiness from them or righteousness from them. But they are seeking to reach souls. And so they are going to do this, submit to this culture, this, uh, what do you call it? Tradition in order to reach these people. So you and I, even though we have been made free from all of these things of the world, we could say to ourselves, I can do this and I'll be all right. I can do that and, and I think I'm free in Jesus to do that. That doesn't mean we abuse that power in order to just use the grace of God and to be able to bask in it, but rather have a mature mind of knowing I am here to win souls. Jesus has set me free. And I'm just going to share this real quick about alcohol and then we'll move on. Alcoholism has affected so many lives. It is such a, I see at the youth center, these kids, these, their parents, it has affected them. It has infiltrated through every aspect of people's lives. In fact, there would be some people, it would be hard to find actually somebody who has not in some way, shape or form been affected by alcohol in some way, shape or form. And I was just doing a bus thing and for a CDL, they're always having you do like uh, tests and online things for the school bus and different things. And they were talking about the dangers of alcohol with even driving. One beer is enough to, it, one beer will stay in your body for one hour is what they said. One beer will stay in your body for one hour. Two beers will stay in your body for two hours and so forth. And of course it changes with your body type the, the smaller you are, uh, you know, it will affect you differently. But one drink can be enough of an intoxication to you to uh, alter your judgment. And they're using all of that with driving. Is that one beer, if you think, oh, I'm just going to have one beer, that one beer alters your judgment enough that if you then get behind the wheel, you are not performing as well as you were if you had nothing in your body. And as a believer, as a Christian, when the Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe, and I've encountered many, who they were seeking that intoxication in order to feel the, the, the power and the, and the lightness of whatever it does. I've never been drunk, so I don't know what it feels like, but it must be something. But the Bible says don't seek that intoxication feeling through alcohol, but rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to be your guide. Because if I'm intoxicated to where it is affecting my judgment, I can guarantee you because it is spirits, I am not hearing the Holy Spirit like I need to. I am allowing myself, I am submitting to the devil's playground because I am submitting myself to something that he uses drastically. And it goes that way with, you know, even nowadays, you know, in so many states are legalizing marijuana. Uh, people will say, well, you know, it's not going to hurt you and all that. It, it alters your ability to have judgment. To make the right choice. And every time in the Bible, when it is talking about people being intoxicated, it is 100% always in light of foolishness. And they make poor decisions. That is not the position of the children of God and how we should be living our life. Just because you might say, I am free in Jesus, I can do whatever I want. Jesus turned water into wine. Which I believe if you're going to know what you're talking about, you're taking it out of context when you're using that as, a, as your alibi. And you're also denying a thousand other scriptures that is clearer than that. But you're using freedom in order to try and stay in the bondages of the world. And he, Paul is saying, 
I care more about the gospel of Jesus Christ than that. I'm not going to hinder for one moment. If one soul goes to hell because of me, that's on me. Because of my actions, I will not hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me read these next two verses and then I'll pause and you guys can share before we move on to the next one. Uh, verse 13. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So Paul is, again, making this statement that a pastor should be being paid the fivefold ministry should be being paid. This is all biblical according to God's word. And yet he's saying, yet we chose not to use that power over you because we did not want to hinder the gospel in any way, shape, or form. We didn't want you to have to support us. So we took the loss and we suffered even the more so that you could benefit from it. As such, every one of us ought to be doing for the kingdom of God. If I deny myself, I'm going to glorify God. If I deny myself, I could start to see souls won for Jesus Christ. Take up that cross daily and follow after Jesus. Nobody said it was going to be easy. But it's where I want to go. Because I can tell you right now, just like we talked about last week, you know, eternity is forever. And if we're only looking at this life and, our, and, the, and the eternal soul in this life, it's fleeting. It's here one day and gone the next. That's right. But eternity is forever and so is our soul. So let's have eternity in mind and not the temporal. Amen? Before we get to verse 15, go ahead. Um, where is the line? Because what if somebody tries to take that about... Like about where is it like compromising? Where like if they try to say, "Well, I'm doing this so that I don't," but yet really they're doing it. I'm not maybe being clear. To compromise, like where if they're convicted of wearing a turban, yep. or like what if somebody says, "Well, I can do this because I don't want to offend them," so I'm just. But yet really, it's just they're wanting to partake of the world. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, where is the line of? Well, you know, again, we're using scenarios. The turban, if you're a missionary and you're going to a land where they're wearing turbans, I think you should get over that before you make that decision to go, right? Because that would offend somebody, you know, especially like the women. They have to have their head covered uh, in those countries. And we all know, you know, the Bible tells us that the woman was given long hair as a covering. And so, and that her husband is a head and covering over her. God is the head of the man. So we understand the whole dimensions there. But if you're going to go to a, a missionary field and then refuse to do that, you'd have to be willing to reap the consequences of, of what that would bring upon you. But I think, you know, I've encountered people in our society, and of course the turban isn't something, but while we're talking about alcohol, it is something that is serious in our society is uh, I have heard Christians say, well, I am drinking with them right. because I don't want to offend them and tell them no. Well, I got to tell you, that's a bunch of baloney because you will not offend anybody by telling them you don't drink. 100%. I mean, if you just tell them I don't drink, there's people at work that have offered me to go out and, and, and drink with them. And I just, I don't drink. And they don't have a problem with it. It's just like, oh, okay, well, Ethan doesn't drink. It isn't like I'm offending them. And if there is an offense, it's because they're convicted themselves of what they're doing. That's right. So, you know, that, that, that lie that people will use, I don't want to offend them, so I'm going to go ahead and do this. Uh, it's exactly they're deceiving themselves in order for them to continue to live the life that they want to live and not surrender their life truly over into the hands of Jesus. Um, when I got saved, there was a lot of things that I struggled with. God set me free of a lot. But then there was some things he didn't. 
And there was pushing through. Father, help me. Lord, give me your strength to give this up. Help me, Lord, to let go of this. And God wants to deliver us completely from everything that is tied and linked to the world. But so many are so in love with the world and the lust thereof that they would rather use liberty as the excuse so that they can remain in it. And they're lukewarm. They're attempting to lay hold of the world and to Jesus. And you can't. That will, you will not get to heaven doing that. Because you have to let go of one or the other. The, the, the love of the world is the, is the enemy of God. So you can't hold on to both. We either choose Jesus and give ourselves fully over to him, or else we're attempting to enjoin a covenant that won't work. And so as we dig deeper into what the word is telling us about this, and I, I do want to in just a little bit turn to John 15, but as we dig deeper into this, uh, it is evident that God wants us to follow his word. This is the guide to our life. And the more and more we're in this, the more God's going to pull us out of the things of the world. And I guarantee you, if somebody is doing worldly things, they are blending in with the world so much that they are not doing any good to the kingdom of God. And that's what Paul is saying here, is that he doesn't want us to hinder in any way, shape, or form the gospel of Jesus. Anybody else? Go ahead. Um, I think that's the bullseye, is um, we know that God's heartbeat is souls. That is why Jesus went to the cross. It isn't, it wasn't for, I mean, there were other blessings with it, but right. it was for the souls. 100%. And so if our heartbeat is not for souls, it's like we are off kilter. We, no. we don't have God's heartbeat in us. Right. Souls has, has to be what makes us get out of bed in the morning, no. what drives us, gives us the purpose. Yeah, that wins souls is wise. No. No. Go ahead, Belle. You gotta talk loud because I can't hear you. Now the Holy Spirit is going to lead us into truth. If somebody claims they have the Holy Spirit of God but they're not walking in truth, they're a liar. That's what John tells us in his epistles. If they profess to know Jesus, but they are not walking in the word, they're not, they're liars. They're not being led by the Holy Spirit. And that is for me as a guideline to not only look in the mirror of my own heart and constantly examine myself and how God wants me to live and how God wants me my walk to continue to be drawn closer to him. But it also is because as a church, we better be judging the fruit that we are seeing. The problem with the church today is they have no judgment at all. And we already talked about this when Paul was telling them, you know, you're to judge angels. You can't even judge amongst yourself the simplest things. God has called us to make a judgment call based upon his word. And if the church is so unfit today, to be able to look and say what is right and what is wrong based upon God's word, then we are in a very poor condition. But praise God, the true church of Jesus is not in such a condition. The remnant, the true church of Jesus Christ, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that church is standing in the gap and they're lifting up the word of God and they're not allowing it to be trampled on. And that's how we better be as the church. Amen. Anybody else? All right. Verse 15. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. Ain't that awesome? 
Paul says, I would rather die than for it to be that I don't get credit in the eyes of God for, for what I've done here. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. This is Paul speaking. I, I'm telling you, out of all the men in the Bible, apart from Jesus himself, I probably put Paul on the biggest pedestal. Because this man is nothing but a machine for the gospel of Jesus. He's denied himself everything. A family, he's denied his own birthright. And everything that he had worked hard for, his own college degrees, he counted it all done that he might win Christ. And even laboring so that he could preach the gospel for free, he says, ain't nobody taking this from me. I ain't going to give this up for nothing. Because when I get to glory, I want it to all be credited to me that I did this for the kingdom of God's sake. He says, uh, though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for neither uh, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I will have a reward. But if it's against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Meaning that Paul recognizes it comes down to the heart of what our heart is truly sold out for. I'm either sold out to the kingdom of God and want to do his will because he is my love. Don't say you love Jesus, but yet you don't follow his word. That's what the word tells us. Don't say that we are in love with Jesus, but yet we're not following the guidance of the Bible, allowing it to lead us. This is the direction we've got to go. And I know that there are different maturity ages in people. And, you know, just because someone says, well, I've been saved for 70 years, that doesn't mean they're mature, not one bit. And just because someone has only been saved one year, that doesn't mean they're immature. It has to do with what they know and how they're walking. Amen? I mean, I honestly knew he's gone on to be with the Lord, but he lived, I don't even know, probably 50 years as a Christian when he died. And yet, I can't really even see the maturity of where he was at, at his death, to where he just be, got saved. It was like he maintained a life of being a baby Christian. That's sad. That he knew the Lord for a long time, but he never matured in the knowledge of God's word. I don't want to be that way. And I also have known people that just got saved. Paul did. I mean, when Paul got saved, he instantly started preaching the gospel of Jesus so much that it confounded the Jews because they couldn't even argue with him. Because he just, he was growing rapidly in Jesus Christ. As I've known Christians who are, were only saved for a short time, and yet it was like, wow, you have really grown in Jesus quickly. That's the power of God's word. That's the Holy Spirit at work in our life. That's the way I want to be. I want to grow in Jesus. And I want to be more mature today than I was yesterday. Amen? He says, uh, well unto me if I preach not the gospel, if I do this thing willingly, I will have a reward. But if I do it against my will, if I am being forced to do it, if you're a, a pastor and you're doing it as a career, don't think you're getting any kind of reward in heaven. You're getting your payment now. That's, right. That's what he's saying. This is a calling. I think someone said the other day, if you are seeking to be famous, whatever you do, don't become a pastor. 100%. But that's what people are doing. They want to become famous. So they're like just joining the pastor club so that they can have their books and become wealthy and have their jets. And Too many pastors in pulpits are seeking to become famous, seeking to become popular. He says, don't think for one moment that you're going to get a reward. Verse 18, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel... I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. 
For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself a servant unto all, that I might gain the more. So when I am choosing to live a certain way, it's not because I'm being legalistic, because my faith is in Jesus. He's made me free from the law. Even though I am free from all of that, I am choosing to become a servant for the gospel's sake. I don't go out and do things that other Christians might claim liberty and, free, and the freedom of the gospel to do because I will not allow my reputation to be defamed. I will not allow for one moment to fall into the trap of the enemy because I guarantee you, you know, they're called sipping saints. If, you, if you're a sipping saint, you are only a few potholes away from falling into the dangerous hands of Satan because you don't play with the devil and get away with it. And it goes on and on and on. We're kind of picking on booze because that's what we were talking about last week. But there's so many other things that we could go and use as a scenario. But we're not going to abuse the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 19, though I'm free from men, yet I will, yet I've made myself a servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law of God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. There's so many Christians over the years that have used these scriptures as an excuse. You know, I'm going to go drink at the bar because I'm going to win the, the people at the bar. Hey, Marsh, can you shut this blind for Brother Carl? Oh, he's got it. I hate to see you hurt. It hurts me. It, it hurts me to see you hurt. So many Christians have said, you know, I'm going to go to the bar and I'm going to win the lost. And they've used this scripture and twisted it. I'm just becoming all things to all people that I might win some. That's ludicrous. It is not the interpretation of what Paul is saying. He's not using this as a reason to commit sin so that we can win some. But he is rather telling us that that was his heart, was that if it meant not eating bacon so that I could win this person, I won't eat bacon. I'll submit to that because his soul is worth more than me eating bacon. Amen? This person's soul is eternal. And if I eat bacon, it's here today and not the dross tomorrow. That's all the more it's worth. That soul is worth more. That's what Jesus was telling us. So he's saying, I became all things to all people because I wanted to win the lost. I wanted to win Jesus. The fact is, that's pretty much probably in Acts when Paul is arrested for the last time. Remember when he shaves his head and he puts himself under that vow? And I've always pondered, why did Paul do that? Because James is kind of, he's the one that's putting it all on him. The Jerusalem church is bringing up the law to Paul and saying, you know, you need to do this and put yourself under this so that uh, nobody be believes that you're breaking the law. Well, we know what Paul taught, taught. We're not under the law of Moses. We're free from that. And yet Paul goes and puts himself under this. I think the scripture is a perfect example of what he must have been thinking is seeking not to cause this division here that he was becoming all things to all people to win the lost. Verse 22, to, to the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. Paul's heart was souls, without a doubt. His heart was, what can I do to win these people for Jesus Christ? And he was willing to go to great extents to be able to reach the lost for Jesus. If it meant dressing up in a clown suit, he would do it. If it meant being shipwrecked and lost out to sea, he would do it without hesitation. All the nights he spent hungry when he could have been full. All the nights he spent cold and naked when he could have been warm and clothed. 
Yet he chose to become all of that because there was a mission to complete. And yet here we sit in our cushioned seats in the United States of America and we aren't even willing to give up the slightest of things that are going to make us even a, a bit uncomfortable because we just want it. Our lust is towards it. And we're going to use our Christian freedom to say it's okay. Paul's saying, let it not be done. Think about the souls that you're affecting. Amen? Go ahead. Won't that only come from having a personal love life with Jesus? You know what I'm saying? To, to like, Paul, to be willing to do that. You know, how many people do they really have a personal relationship with Jesus, or is it just a religious head knowledge? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? People. You, you can't give or, or live a, a life like that without the strength of Jesus. Yeah. Being alive with you. You know? Yeah. And when people say they love Jesus, but they're not following his word. They don't really love Jesus. The word of God doesn't abide in them. And I told you, John 15, I wanted to turn there. Let's turn there now, if you would. But that, this is what he's telling us. John 15, 1. He says, I am the, vine, the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me, in Christ, it will bear that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word. That's the importance of God's word. It makes us clean. It brings Amen. us into the truth. Amen. Which I have spoken unto you. He says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. When people are attempting to live for God, supposedly, without Jesus, it isn't going to happen. They're just going through motions, and they're going through ritualistic acts. We'll pick on the Catholic Church again and all of those that are like them. They do a lot of ritualistic stuff. The Lutheran Church denomination uh, is about as close to Catholicism as you could get without being Catholic. I mean, I've been into some Lutheran churches that you would have to ponder, is this Lutheran or is this Catholic? Because they look so similar. Um, and yet the ritualistic things that people do in those church services, they think it heaps to themselves the righteousness of Christ. But yet he says... Without me, you can do nothing. If you're not truly sold out to the Jesus of the Bible, you can do nothing. Unless you are abiding in him, his life-flowing spirit is a daily sap in your branches, bringing fruit to your life. You will not bear good fruit. We have to abide in him. If, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, as with withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire. Paul talks in Romans about the grafting of the vine, referring to Israel. But he's also then in the same chapter referring to the Gentile church also being grafted in. So it all goes hand in hand. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch, as withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words, this is the importance of the word, yes. abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. That's the desire of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to bear fruit for him. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. You know, I won't say his name, but there's a brother in the Lord that I know. He was an alcoholic. Jesus saved him on a sidewalk. He had been going to AA meetings and nothing was helping him. He accepted Jesus Christ right there on the sidewalk, gave his heart to the Lord, and God set him free. 
changed him in his heart. Okay? But he continued, even though he wasn't drinking liquor anymore, he continued to be a beer a day Christian. Okay? And he was supposedly delivered of alcohol. And yet every night he would drink a beer. Even on a Sunday, you know, Sunday night church, go home, drink a beer. And this continued for years until all of a sudden he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, and let me just say this, when you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit instantly in you. You can't even get saved without the Holy Spirit. So in the moment you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are filled. But there is a secondary work of the baptism and the Holy Spirit. It is clear in the Bible that he will fill you afresh again and again and again. And it, when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, instantly he was set free from that, from that booze. Now, he knew it was wrong, but it was a struggle to him. He knew every time he drank that beer that it was wrong that he was doing that. God's grace was still sufficient, but the Holy Spirit was at work. The fearful thing is when we get to the point where we say, hey, too bad, so sad, I'm going to do what I want, I'm going to drink my beer, if you have a problem with it, you know, go away. That attitude is not an attitude of the Holy Spirit at work in that heart. It is an attitude of, I'm going to do my will, God's will can shove it. That's dangerous. That's where there is a serious issue. He says, if you're in me, you will bear good fruit. You will begin to produce this work, even if it's a conviction of the Holy Spirit, that is a sign of the Spirit at work in your life. Amen? I love the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciple. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken unto you, that your joy might remain in, in you, and your joy might be full. You don't even know true joy until you are walking in the will of God. There's no greater peace than walking in the will of God, of knowing that God is in you, with you, he's fighting for you, you talk about invincible, you know. I've been into some spiritual battles where I was, I wasn't arrogant. I was just really confident because I knew it was like I was walking in and I had God right behind me. You can do and say what you want, but here's my attorney. Amen. He's fighting my battles for me. Wow. That type of authority, that type of confidence Lord. in the word of God there's nothing like that feeling when you are walking in the will of Almighty God. Right. What man can do anything to you? There's none. But if we are walking with a tainted mind, uh, conscience, all that begins to be affected. We're not as bold as we ought to be in Christ Jesus. And God doesn't want us to live that way. Amen? I would really love to get through this chapter Brother Carl might not know, you know, he, he was telling me to just keep preaching, not to worry about the clock. What if I get into a bad habit, Brother Carl? We start having two, three-hour services. Lord of love. Amen. Anybody have anything? We're going to go to verse 24. Go ahead. Well. Anybody else? All right. First Corinthians chapter uh, 9, 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, 
but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Now, you know, the Olympics just took place. Kathy's always using the Olympians in lessons at the youth center. You know, these Olympians, they work four years for one event, right? They are training every day. They're putting their bodies through extreme workouts, through extreme diets, everything for an event. And that is all corruptible. So Paul's using that as an example. There are men who are temperate and they bring their body under subjection. They're, they're diligent and they are doing all of this for just an earthly crown, an earthly prize. And they do all of that because that's the goal that they're running for. And now Paul is saying, let's use that same ideology spiritually, is that we are running a spiritual race for all of eternity. He says, if therefore so run, you need to run with that same type of temperance, that same type of determination, that same type of certainty. So fight I, not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I mean, that's Paul saying that. That he has brought continuously looks and examines his heart that even after he had preached the gospel to all of these people and all of you know the machine that this man has been in in the missions for the gospel of Jesus Christ that if that he himself would be a castaway when we look into our own life and our own heart we better not be using and abusing the grace that God has given us to be free from the law, to be free from bondage, and use it as an excuse to attempt to continue to live in sin. Sadly, this is where much of the modern church, that's what they're doing, is you cannot even tell the difference between the world and their life in the, in the modern church. Because they're simply professing Jesus with their mouth, but they're living their life the way they want. And Paul is blatantly exposing it, saying the kingdom of God is worth more than that. God has set me free. His grace has been given to me. He set me free of so many sins. And there's still things in my life I want God to set me free from because we ain't perfect yet. Amen. He's still, we're still a work in progress. But I'm not blind that I'm going to say, hey, this is just the way I am, you know, deal with it. No, I want God to continue his work in me. I, I want God to continue to change my way of thinking, to change the way I view things. I want his revelation of the things of his word, of the spiritual. I want my eyes to not be on the temporal, but I want to see the eternal value of everything. That's the change I want God in my, that I want in my life. I want the lust of the flesh and the things of this life to be more dim. Yes. The way that I used to think, I want God to continue to make that be a used to thing and not a current thing. I want God to continue that work. And never should we ever be to a point where we're just like, it's the way I am and God's grace is going to enough. I can just do whatever I want. That's an abuse of the grace of God. God's grace will bring us closer to Jesus in every way, shape, or form. Amen? Anybody in closing have anything on your heart? God spoke to me just now, brother. He told me that he's given you the desires of your heart, those things that you long for so long that he's bringing you into a maturity that just you've been longing for. Yeah. And I feel the Holy Ghost. And when I feel the Holy Ghost, I know He said it. Yep. Not, not just a man. Amen. Go ahead. I feel a lot of times people become lukewarm, stale. Um, we need to pray that we stay on fire for the Lord and yeah. not lose that. Yeah. 
because um, so many Christians end up just, yep. you know, lukewarm. Yep. And if we love the Lord with all our hearts, we should want to do His will. Yep. And not just sit comfortably, always try to win souls. Yep. Even when we're at Walmart or, yep. you know, wherever we may be, let the Lord use you if that's what He wants to do. Yep. Everything should have an eternal purpose in our heart of what for the kingdom of God's sake. And I know that when I look back on my life, I can see my walk with Jesus kind of like this. There's been ups and there's been downs. There's been times that I felt like I was not mature and spiritually on fire is what you know, people say. On fire for God like I should have been. And there was other times that I felt like I was just at a whole new level where God was just showing me stuff and drawing closer to him every, every day. A hunger for his word more and more. I mean, there have been, as a young man, there was, which is a lot for a young man, you know, nowadays, I was looked at as kind of weird when I first got saved because as a 16-year-old boy that just got saved, uh, you know, most 16-year-olds were, you know, looking to buy a car. They were looking for girls. They were, you know, living that type of... And all I wanted to do was eat up his word. And I would just spend hours that God would make me so sick watching TV that I was convicted to even watch TV. And I knew I had to get into God's word. And it was the only place I would find peace. And now I look back, I'm 41 years old. And, man, those days were awesome, you know? I mean, because there are days where it's just like, it's, it's, it's you got to make yourself get in the Word. you got to tell yourself, i got to do it. If, if I don't do it now, I'll put it off for later, and then later something else is going to happen. And before long, I don't do it at all. And then tomorrow, I, I've been there. I know that's the way it works. To find that time to get into God's word. To, to open it up and to see what God's going to tell me. And I'll think back of how easy it was when I was 16. Because it was just, it was like this was dessert. I could not get enough of it. And nothing else tasted good. This is all I wanted to do. And I wish in some ways it was that easy now. Of course, now there's jobs, there's work, there's family, there's all of these things that are always competing. And it was just so much easier back then, it seems. But that isn't an excuse. God wants us in his word. He'll show us great and amazing things if we'll yeah. seek him. Anybody else? There's a lot of Christians out there saying they're Christians, but they are. Uh... Or up and down. They always put their family first before they get poor and look. Yep. It's always yep. their family first, you know? Yep. That's right. Yep. That is a big one because right. the, 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 the world would say put the family first. Yep. And God wants you to put the family first. But God's worse is if you love them more than you love me, you don't deserve me. That's right. And the more we put God first, family will come up underneath yeah. it. Yeah. And we'll start to see the blessing in the household. But 100%, you know, I know churches that close services because they say, well, just stay home with your family, have, have movie night. Or, you know, during the summer, churches will close because of sports, baseball and all that. And go spend time with your family, you know, with the sports. I think that's the worst thing we could do. You know, Ethan loves sports. He would love to play baseball. He would love to play football. And I'm telling, you know, when are you going to have time? You have the youth center. You get church. If you do those things, these are going to com be compromised. You just need to be thankful for the times that you're able to play and do different things. But to pour yourself into a sport, you're going to have to give up the kingdom of God in order to maintain that. And it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And I want to instill that within him at a young age and not be enabling him. As much as, you know, people could say, you know, as a dad, I'm denying my son the privilege of playing competitive sports. Well, I'd rather see him in heaven. That's right. I'd rather see him get his priorities truly right 
with the things down here because this is temporal. That's right. I want him to have eternity on his on his mind. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? We're late, Bell. Can you tell me later? I kind of hard to hear you tonight. Anyway, very difficult to hear what you're saying. Tell me later, okay? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the example that Paul set, the, the word that you put within him to write. Lord, the Holy Spirit is so real in our daily walk. The conviction of the Spirit to, the, to, to your children is great. For people to say they have experienced the grace of God, but there is no sign of grace in their life. Lord, it's foolishness. Your grace is truly sufficient and you will draw us and, and reel us in. And I thank you for doing that to us because we didn't choose you. You truly chose us. You drew us with your loving kindness. You gave us a heart that could repent. And then you gave us the, the, the measure of faith to believe. Lord, we thank you for the grace of Almighty God. May we not for one moment abuse it or use it for our own selfish lusts, but surrender to you for the kingdom of God's sake. There will be rewards given, a crown and rewards. And Lord, I pray that we would not forget the labor of love that Paul did and that he set for us to also do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We love you.